So every day, every day we're making history. You're making history by being here. It'll never be the same again. Uh, you might sit s- kind of in the same place next week, maybe not, but it, it'll never be the same again. And so each each moment counts. Each moment counts. And so uh, what the Lord has brought us into just going through his word here is um, we're going to talk about one man's impact. One man's impact. And so I want to start out talking about there's a man that I know, and maybe you know him too, and I'd have to say you probably do, but you might not know this about him. There's a man that I know that um, has an impact um, that is happening with his neighbors. But here's, here's the story. Um, he's got a driveway that there's several homes that live off this driveway, off the main road. And this driveway is gravel. Okay, And so over the years, since he's been there, there's been more homes that have been built off of this driveway. So, um, but when you drive a gravel road for a while, um, potholes start to develop. And then you figure out, well, if I drive this way, I miss that pothole, and then I swing this way, <laughs> and I miss that one. And, and so after a while, you've got this... It's not straight anymore. It's like this. But then that starts to break down. And then there's potholes here where you were trying to avoid another pothole. And then you find out that the whole thing starts going this way and that way. Does anybody know what I... Did anybody experience that? Okay. So then... So one man's impact was... He said, well, this is my driveway, but it's the neighbor's driveway. And it doesn't appear that anybody's doing anything. So I... And I'm going to go out there with my shovel and my pickaxe. And so he would go out there and he'd loosen up around and he'd, he'd, he'd pull in where the gravel had gone out. He'd pull in to fill in the potholes. And then he took a little water, just kind of pack it down again. And so then he got to enjoy the nice drive up his driveway without the potholes. And his, his neighbors got to enjoy it. And then there were some neighbors that decided to go a little bit faster and you know what happens when they go faster? Two things. What are the two things when you go faster on a dirt road or gravel road? What are, dust. dust? Okay. Dust and what else? The potholes come back. It's like it's, it's magic. There they are again. And so, vroom, you know. And so he goes out with his shovel again. The one man's impact. And he strains it out again. And, and then it's a nice road again. And... What it's like mom's doing the dishes. It's just, uh, this is, I'm just doing it over again. Deja vu, it's happening again. So then um, his property required really a tractor. So he decided, I can get a tractor to do the things on my property, but then I don't have to do a shovel. I can have this tractor and I can blade this. And so he graduated to the tractor and it made sense. I need this tractor for the driveway and I need it for my property. So he paid to the nose to get the tractor and it was a beautiful thing. And so he goes out and he straightens out that driveway and it's nice and smooth. And so more neighbors are starting to come, you know, and so it's everyone's driveway. But it appears that he's the one making the impact on people's lives by making it smooth. Now, some, some new neighbors, they don't know the history here, and so vroom. So then he decides, well, they, they don't know. <laughs> they don't know what I'm trying to do here. So he goes out and he stands with his shovel by the road when he knows they're coming. <laughs> and in love, hey, in love, he says, you may not be aware of this, but um, I blade this road so it's nice and smooth. And when you go fast, it, it digs up the potholes again. And then I, I have to do this again. And it sure would be nice if you slow down. So one man's impact affected the whole neighborhood to have a pleasant road. And then there's another man's impact that caused... 
it's selfishness, right, that causes not to go along with the, um, the mayor of that driveway now is the one that owns the tractor, right? Our lives are full of potholes, and there's people that cause potholes, um, and sometimes we're the ones that cause potholes for other people to have a smooth. And so then when we become aware of the knowledge of who God is and how one man's impact can impact so many people, then we realize that not only am I helping people with their potholes, but they're helping me. And that's God's kingdom is about this love for one another. And we get glimpses. You know the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That we get a glimpse of heaven here on earth when that we're doing our part, when our lives are impacting others for the kingdom. Amen? So that's what it's about here today. We're going to look at one man's life and how it impacted the kingdom of God at that time. But here's the interesting thing. We don't hear anything about this man until right now in Scripture, and then it's just for a chapter, and then he's off the scene. He has an impact that is so amazing that his name is recorded in the Scriptures, but it's very short. The Holy Spirit comes upon him and he does what he's supposed to do and then God takes him home and he's off the scene. You and I don't know the time that we have to impact people's lives. But let's look at this man and guess what? His name was Stephen, Stephen. And so I get to talk about who I was named after and it's kind of cool. So open up to Acts chapter 6. So last week we talked about um, that there were the widows uh, were missing out in the food distribution, and so where's the love? And so they brought up this issue, and uh, the apostles said, well, let's choose seven, Michaela, let's choose seven, seven um, uh, godly men with good reputation that are filled with the Holy Spirit to handle this business. They need to... Uh, take care of this pothole. Somehow we missed it. Everybody should get it, you know, get the love, get the distribution. And so Stephen was one named in there. And so I want you to see uh, chapter 6, verse 5, and then we'll, we'll go on through the end of the chapter. But chapter 6, verse 5, it says, and this saying, so to f- choose godly men, it says, Uh, pleased the multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. And I want to stop there because it names the others, but Stephen, he's on the scene, and then by the end of the chapter, he's done his work. It's finished. Um, But go down to uh, verse 8. And in verse 8, it talks about his character, And really, he's talking about the Holy Spirit in Stephen. But up here, it said, full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 8. And we're going to look at these words here before we go through um, this one man's impact. Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Now, some of your translations say, and Stephen, full of grace. So I decided to take both those words and kind of uh, do a search on those and bring those together. So here was his character. His reputation was known by this, by his faith and his power, or by his grace and his power and the wonders, the signs among the people. So let's, let's look at that for a minute. Um, okay. So, so faith, if you have your bulletins, you'll see uh, in the scriptures it describes faith in chapter 11 of Hebrews. It says, faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the convictions of things not seen. 
So he believes beyond what he can see. This is, this is a description of faith. This is Stephen. Now he believes beyond what he can see. It also says in Hebrews 11, verse, uh, chapter 11, verse 6, uh, without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That's you. Diligently seeking him. What does that look like in your life? He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So that's, that's, that's a place like here's the church goers and then here's people that are diligently seeking God. That they believe in this reward that he has for them. Here's, you could say, the seven that were chosen, their reputation. They weren't just coming to the meetings and the food distribution, but they were diligently seeking God. And I guess my question is that, is that me? Is that you? D- diligently seeking God. Um, there's another scripture that Jesus says, seek the Lord your God with all of your heart. Seek him. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these worries that you have, they'll be taken care of. But seek God first. That's, that's what he was saying. And every day you and I have the opportunity to go, oh, do I get worried about this or do I seek God first and then take care of business? Okay. So oh, faith. Um, in chapter 12 of Hebrews, it talks about Jesus being the author and perfecter of your faith, that this isn't something you're just uh, just trying harder. Uh, I'm going to wake up early in the morning and I'm going to just be... Uh. No, it's, it's Christ, it's his Holy Spirit that when you submit to him and his way, he does it through you. You don't try harder, you submit more to him and then you see the power happening. And I think that's a mistake that we get caught in because of this American world, this American life that we live in, that we just, if we just stay up longer, right? if we just work harder, um, but f- put him first and then watch how much more you can do. Amen? I think, raise your hand if you've experienced that. If you put God first and then watch how much more he does through you. Amen? Man, that, it, that is so cool. Because you know the difference when you do it yourself and you go, man, there's not enough hours in the day and then somehow you do it God's way and you go, how did that happen? I got got it all done. Praise God, right? So this was was Stephen. This was his character. He was full of the Holy Spirit. So grace. So that's the other word that's used in some of your translations, grace. Grace. Turn to John chapter 14. So we're in Acts chapter 6. Keep your marker here because that's our home page. Go to John chapter uh, 1. Gospel of John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John chapter 1. Verse 14. And he's talking about Jesus, referring to Jesus as being the word of God. Jesus is the living word. We have the written word. We have the spoken word of God recorded. uh, And we get to speak that also. So it says here in verse 14, And the word became flesh. So that's Jesus. He was born. He became flesh and he dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. That's his wonder. That's his amazing who he really is. Son of God, son of man. We beheld his glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Grace and truth. Grace and truth. What did I just say? Grace and truth. This was Jesus. This is what the Holy Spirit in Stephen was grace, and it was truth. Grace. What is grace? It's unmerited favor. You don't deserve it, but God has given it to you. So Stephen was a man that was giving love or giving grace to those that didn't deserve it. Maybe those that were complaining, he somehow he graced them out. You know, for you and I, 
we don't know what people go through. We don't know, even in this room, we don't exactly know the things that we're going through. There's some of you right now are sitting and there is pain in your body and it's happening and nobody else really knows that. And you're just going, you know, when I smile, that's a big deal because I feel like frowning because it hurts so much. And you're sitting there going, and, and we don't know that. And so we, we grace each other out, right? And that's what Stephen, we just, you know, I don't know, you know, I don't know why you're frowning. Maybe you've got a headache. Maybe, maybe there's a relationship and your heart is breaking and you don't know, but your fuse is short and you just kind of, yep, you're just kind of nippy. Well, when we see that, it's like we need the love, need the love. So I was uh, last week at the, uh, um, our potluck, potluck, um, was sitting with, um, I sat with different people at different times, and this one guy over here, he was explaining that there was this gal in his old church that just was, you know, just hard to get along with. And the Holy Spirit came upon him, and and uh, so he uh, was talking to her and she was kind of kind of nipping at different things and all of a sudden he says, you know what? I think you need a hug. She's going, God. He said, you need a hug, don't you? Yes, I need a hug. So he went, he hugged her. That whole relationship changed. Now, I don't expect you to start hugging each other right now, but you know, there's, and so when I was sitting there, there was a, a young man here, uh, well, young, I don't I, younger than me. So, um, and after he told me that story, he was standing back here kind of looking like, okay, where do I go next, you know? And I went up to him and I said, I think you need a hug. And I just <laughs> gave him a hug. <laughs> he said, how did you know? I, I, I don't know. You're just looking like you were lost. And so... You know, there's, there's a physical touch that some people don't get, and maybe they just need a touch on their shoulder. Maybe it's been a long time. Uh, Jim Stiltz here, he lost, uh, not Stiltz, he's back there. Jim Stansfield here, his wife passed away about six years ago, and maybe he hasn't had, you know, a hug or a touch from someone, and maybe just you shaking hands or touching their shoulder, maybe a hug, um, but certainly the love. And this was... Stephen, grace was explained, and that is, maybe they don't deserve it because they're porcupines, but give them a hug, and maybe it'll hurt at first, a spiritual hug. But this was the character of Stephen, and he had an impact that was just so, in time, it was just that, that quick. We don't hear anything about him, and all of a sudden, he was chosen as one of these seven to take care of this issue and they chose him because he was full of the Holy Spirit, his reputation of grace, that he was gracing people. And Michaela, you need a hug. I just, yeah. <laughs> That's my granddaughter there. And, you know, I think the people that give out hugs need it more, right? So you just tapped into something there. So let's go back to Acts chapter 6. And it's describing in verse 8, Jesus, uh, uh, Stephen, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, really, full of grace or full of faith. And it says power. That power comes from Acts chapter 1, verse 8, where Jesus promises that you will receive power to live this new life. And really what he was saying, to be my witness. And that grace and that truth of Jesus, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through believing in Jesus and living a life following Jesus' teaching of love and of helping people to find him. That's really what that means. And so um, there is not many ways. Jesus just took, took care of all that, all the different religions there is not many ways to roam. There's not many ways to heaven. No matter what comes out in the world, 
Jesus, the son of God, son of man says, unless you believe in me and my love for you from the cross, there's no heaven. So you must believe and that's a life change. So this in Acts 1.8 says, and Jesus said, and you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you to be my witness. And then he tells them where? He said, in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and then to the ends of the world. That's where we are. We're, we're almost to the ends of the world here. It's, you can see it from here, right? <laughs> so power. So here's Stephen's character. It was grace, faith, and power. They were seeing the power that he boldly proclaimed Jesus Christ, Son of God, the Messiah, the one for life eternal. He boldly proclaimed that with power and boldness. Not only that, but it says here of him in verse 8, there were great wonders and signs among the people. You know what that means? It means miracles. There were some things that were unexplainable. They were not natural that were happening. Uh, I just, um, if you've experienced a miracle, just raise your hand. And you know it. It's either private or not. Incredible, right? That it still happens. Praise God. And you can't explain it. And I think a lot of those are private miracles that are just between you and God. You know, if you try to explain them, they'll go, uh, no, that was just, you know, it was going to happen. No, it's like, no, you can say whatever you want. I know. God wanted me to know for sure that he was doing this. And you know what we do when stuff like that happens? We give glory to God and we say, thank you, Lord. No matter if anybody else does, we say, you know, I want to be one of the lepers. He came back and Jesus said, where are the... The other nine, where, where, but one came back and t- I want to be that thankful one that anything that happens, I can just say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. So let's all say, thank you, Lord. Thank, thank you, Lord. Lord. Okay, so we're rolling now. We got it. So the wonders and signs, they point to Jesus. Whenever that happens, they're designed to point to, he is the answer to life. Look at one of these that happened in John, Gospel of John again, chapter 6. Here's Jesus doing a sign. And one of the signs that he did to prove who he was and is, um, was, you know, in the Old Testament times when the Israelites had escaped, that God set them free from Egypt. And they're in the wilderness. They didn't have any food. Well, God uh, brought manna down from heaven, like the superfood, and they got to eat it, and it sustained them, and he provided water for them. Well, guess what? Jesus did that same thing. And people that realized what was going on were drawn to Jesus, and then there was another group going, boy, that tasted good. Can I get some more of that? It's like, they missed it. <laughs> And here's how, G, how it goes. So uh, chapter 6 of John, verse 22. The following day, when the people who were standing on the other side of the sea saw that there uh, was no other boat there except the one which the disciples had entered and that Jesus had not entered in the boat and the disciples, but his disciples had gone away alone. Uh, let me drop down to verse 25. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Is that amazing? Two kinds of people. One that are, they don't see the that Jesus just provided for them. But they're just going, could you give us some more? Like, we, like if, is this a free, is this the place of the free food? Can I just keep getting this? He said, you didn't even see the sign that I am the Messiah. I am the one. So watch this. He says then in verse 27, do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life which the Son of Man will give you because God the Father has set his seal on him. Verse 28. 
Then they said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? Good question, isn't it? Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. How is that work? Somebody answer that for me. How is believing that work? Believing. He says, this is the work of God that you believe in him who he sent. Uh, Isn't it just, okay, I believe, there, it's done. What, what is he talking about with this belief? It's... He, he must be a follower of Jesus and the works of Jesus Christ <laughs> and produce works. Woohoo! <laughs> Thank you, Donald. Yes, the works that he does will produce. The fruits that you do will produce. It's not just this. It's a life lived following Jesus. Thank you, Donald. I think we have a preacher back there. That's pretty cool. Thank you for saying that. So he goes on to say, and then therefore they said to him, what sign will you perform then that we will see it and believe you? What work will you do? Well, he already did it. They didn't see it. They said, our fathers ate manna in the desert, as is written, he gave them bread from heaven. And so maybe there's, maybe just thinking, Maybe they're playing this game going, maybe we can trick him into feeding us again. Yeah, maybe. That's kind of what it sounds like they're doing. Oh, our fathers received manna from heaven. What about? Okay. Jesus said to them, most assuredly I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. What is he talking about? It's not physical. What is he talking about? It's, it's this truth of living our life in God's kingdom way through his Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus was providing. But I say to you, verse 36, that you have seen me and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that all he has given me I should lose nothing, but shall raise it up on the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up on the last day. There it is. If you're here today and you have not truly believed with all of your heart, all of your life, then you have that opportunity today to receive that even right now, to receive this belief and that he will give you the Holy Spirit to walk this new life where it's not all about you, it's not all about your car, your house, your your finances, it's about putting God first and then he brings you things that are out of this world, eternal life and this life with him. It's about a relationship with the one who created you. Just like the flowers, they reflect this creation. You and I are designed to connect with this God and he provided a way through Jesus Christ, him crucified, risen again, the pouring out of his Holy Spirit. So I plead with you today, if you have not, may you respond to God's love today and experience his grace and his mercy and fruits will show up and you'll begin helping others to find life eternal. So here's this explanation back to Acts chapter 6 of the character of Stephen and it was the Holy Spirit full of faith or grace and power and great wonders and signs among the people. They were seeing some amazing miracles 
because of Stephen, it was, it was happening. And so many people were coming to know the Lord. Even priests that were serving in the, in the temple, they were coming to know the Lord. It was like this was an a, amazing thing that the Holy Spirit was doing. Okay. So in Stephen's life then, wouldn't you know it, there's a disruption in the program. There's a disruption in uh, Stephen serving the Lord. And so um, what happens then is that the first disruption, there were some people that came to argue with Stephen about the truth. And these people were called uh, freedmen, and they were um, Jews that were prisoners in Rome that were set free, and there's more to all that. But they were set free. And the, and the interesting thing was, is uh, it looks like they felt like they were part of an elite group because they built themselves uh, with their own finances a synagogue in Jerusalem. And so when they came on festival days, they had their own synagogue in Jerusalem. And they were called the freedmen. So, so there was something... Uh, prestigious, it appears, about this group. So they come uh, to argue with Stephen. And you know what happens? They're shut down. Stephen, because he had the power of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, all their arguments were flipped upside down and ended on the ground, and they were just going, blah, 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 blah. it's like, we can't, we can't talk, we can't, all of the things that we were trying to make sense, he turned around and our stuff doesn't make sense anymore. So here's this elite group, and they're shot down. So watch what happens. So here's the disruption in one man's impact that is very short. So here's what happens. In verse 9, so we're in uh, Acts chapter 6, verse 9. Then there arose from what is called the synagogue of the freedman. Syrians, uh, uh, Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia and Asia. And they were disputing with Stephen. What is another word for disputing? Arguing. Arguing. Or there was a, a, yeah, a good debate, you know, something like that. Let's set up a good debate here. Okay. And, you know, that's kind of cool. Here's, uh, and I think they do this too. When, when there's a debate, they set up the the fence is for the debate. They go, okay, you can't go out of bounds here. And let's have a good debate here. Let's, you have five minutes. You have five minutes. And let's just talk about, okay, a good debate. Can that happen? Uh, uh, I don't know. It doesn't seem to happen. In, uh, anyways, I'll leave that one alone. Um, so they were disputing with Stephen, verse 10. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. So I think they were in awe about whatever they were talking about that he just, they couldn't resist his wisdom. It's like, maybe they were going, yeah, that, that makes sense. No, I can't, no, I can't go with, you know, they caught in that. They couldn't resist the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit was speaking through Stephen. It wasn't that Stephen went to school. Stephen was a nobody. And all of a sudden, God brought him in line because he was fully submitted to him. And God was using him powerfully for a brief time. So, what do people do in the flesh or the dark side? Because they can't win a sensible debate. Um, they try another technique. They try a, a character assassinate. They, they try to, um, they start whispering lies. So that what they couldn't do in a good argument, now they start going outside. Now they went outside the boundaries. What is that all about? But they start whispering. Oh, this is what he said about Moses. And this is what he said about... And, and, it, and it was all lies. And they start whispering. 
So that was the second disruption for Stephen. It's like, okay, see that coming. So they, uh, they talk about uh, Moses. And maybe they came across the scripture in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15, where Moses said, there will be one like me who will come. And if you look at all the things that God did through Moses, you find there's so many things that the Holy Spirit was doing through Jesus Christ feeding of the 5,000, the miracles that were happening, the deliverance, people that were delivered in bondage of the evil one. For we have been not, for we have been delivered from the domain of darkness and transferred to the kingdom of the beloved son in whom we have forgiveness, redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So Christ was doing more than Egypt. He was setting people from the punishment of sin and giving them a new life. So they were, they came in with that whispering lies. And if that wasn't enough, they decided in those lies then to go to the, uh, the mucky mucks, right? The, the high people, right? The, the people in charge, the people with power. So it wasn't enough just with the people. So look at verse 12 then. It says, and they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came to him and they seized him and they brought him to the council. Verse 13, they also set up false witnesses who said this man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. Verse 14, we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. Kind of like our way of life is going to change, everybody. Our way of life is going to change. What are we going to do? It's amazing. So let's look at that place. We're back in the Gospel of John chapter 2 where Jesus does say this. John chapter 2. Um, look at, I guess, start at 13. Now, the Passover of the Jews, John chapter 2, verse 13. Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and money changers doing business. And when he made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers of uh, money and overturn their tables. And he said to those who sold doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Now in the other gospels, it says, my house shall be called a house of prayer. And he began ministering to them. But in John, it says, don't do this. And then it says, the disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal for your house has consumed him. So the Jews answered and said to him, what sign do you show to us since you do these things? And Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And the Jews said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, the disciples remembered that he said this to them and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Here's something pretty crazy. If you think about it, Solomon built the temple. It was destroyed by the Babylonians and and, and a bunch of stuff happened, right? Who built this second temple? Herod. Now, Herod was part Jew, but he had the finances to do this. Why did Herod do that? Why why do you think? What were maybe some of the reasons that Herod built this temple even bigger and more magnificent than Solomon's, maybe? For himself? Okay. And, and, and he is remembered, it wasn't just there, but there's diff- 
in Jerusalem, we'll see some of the places and the ruins that he built that were just, this guy was amazing with his architecture and however that all worked. So here's something interesting that I realized when I was going through this is that where was the Ark of the Covenant um, during the second temple time? Was it in the Holy of Holies? It was not. Do you remember that when it was, the Holy Spirit's presence was there. The mercy seat of God, the very center of who God is, the mercy seat, that's his love, that we all come to receive God's mercy. It was gone. The presence of God was not in the second temple, but it was a a man-made a form of godliness that he was using. And it was beautiful. From what I understand, when you're coming up to worship, when that, there was so much gold and so your eyes would be blinded by this amazing temple on the hill. It was just bright and everything was beautiful. It was bigger than li- anything you had ever seen. And here are the people going to worship at this place. The presence of God was not there. When the presence of God walked back into that place, it was Jesus, the Son of God, Son of Man. The presence of God walked into that place, threw the money changers' tables away. This is how it's supposed to be. He walked in and started healing people. The love of God, the mercy seat of God was right there once again. I don't know, I'm getting shivers right here. They were doing a form of godliness by this beautiful building and wonderful, where's the presence of God? If you've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, he's in you. He's in you. You are the temple. When we come together, this this whole place glows from the universe and the spirit world sees something special happening because we're coming together and representing the temple of God here on earth. And it's called a mobile temple. It's called that tabernacle. Wherever you go becomes a holy place because the Holy Spirit dwells in you. The power of God. I was just floored when I came across them going, this is amazing. So here's Stephen the true Holy Spirit, the temple of God in Stephen, his reputation was out there and grace was flowing out because it's the same Holy Spirit that was working in the body of Jesus, the the human body of Jesus, fully man, fully God. Here's Stephen doing these amazing things and they brought him before the same council the same group of people that had Jesus crucified, they wanted to stop because he's going to change our lifestyle. We're going to have to switch everything. We might lose it all. But what do you have to gain? (laughs) Way more than this stuff. Way more. You know, if it's just peace alone, I'll do that. I don't know about you guys, but I don't like when I'm I don't have peace and I'm just, I'm up at night. And that's a horrible thing, isn't it? But when, when we get to experience God's peace, in his presence is fullness of joy. That's why you take our time in the morning to feed on his word, to feed on the spiritual word so that you're full, so that you're ready for the day, so that Amen. his spirit comes in and you're able to give out the love to those around you that need it desperately. So in Acts chapter 6, closing at our time, so this disruption, they accuse him of destroying the temple. They lie about what this is all about. And Acts chapter uh, 6, it says in verse 15, just... It's just something else crazy that's happened here. It says in 15, and they all sat in the council looking, gazing at him, Stephen, and saw his face as the face of an angel. 
the Holy Spirit was revealing himself in Stephen in a way that they're just something here. It's like filled up. Um, there's a couple of places in Scripture that talks about God revealing himself in this way. And it, Moses is one. Remember when he m- went and met with the Lord and there was a glow that came off of him that just made the people afraid. And so he had to walk with a veil <laughs> and he had to stay there until that, it was just like, oh, he's met with the Lord. There's, And then of course, Jesus himself on the Mount of Transfiguration, it says that his face changed his clothes changed and the, the disciples were able to see the Son of God right there. He, the real Jesus, the real Son of God for that moment and then it was gone and that was... So Stephen now has recorded someone else that was so close to God that it was radiating out of his face. I'd like you to turn to uh, Colossians so you're in Acts now, so Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, um, what comes after Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, there we go, Colossians chapter 3, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 23 and 24, It says, whatever you do, do all heartily as unto the Lord. Or some of you are saying, in whatever work you do, do it as unto the Lord. Not for man, that's not the reason you do it, but you do it as unto the Lord. Amen. Whatever you're, you're working, you're driving your car, whatever you're doing, do it unto the Lord. His Holy Spirit in you. Whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord, not to man. And look at verse 24. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive (laughs) the reward of the inheritance. For you will serve, for you serve the Lord Christ. Evident in how you conduct yourself. So they couldn't stop Stephen, but they went after his character. And that wasn't holding water either. It wasn't holding water. One man's impact changes so many things. And if you've believed on the Lord God, the impact of your life following after the Lord is going to affect so many people for the kingdom of God. And some of you already, you know that. You can look back and go, I know that. I've seen that. But he's got work for us to do. In these times that we live, each one of us need to say, Lord, fill me up. Fill me up to do with the time that I have to impact people's lives for you. You can't do it by just saying, I'm going to try harder. I'm going to get up earlier. I'm going to, no, no, this is where you go, Lord, I I want to, Submit to the truth of who you are and I'm going to submit my life to you, all of it, to you. And you rearrange it so it brings honor to you. You rearrange my life and you put it together to bring honor to you. I don't know how much time you have. I don't know how much time I have. But I think we're in critical times. And we need the Holy Spirit so that we can do what he's plan for us to do yes. is it going to be easy no. no that's why we need the holy spirit so let's pray father god we humble ourselves before you because we know that's a rightful place but lord we're so uh limited we think see i only have this much education or i i i don't have i only can do this or i only can do that But, Father, with you, all things are possible. So, Father, we just bless your name. We humble ourselves before you and we say, 
Lord, we want to do great things for you. And we know that requires your, your Holy Spirit. So Lord, for those in this room that are agreeing with me, first of all, about believing in Jesus with their life and his teaching, how stands it written? And then, Lord, that our sins are forgiven, that we have this relationship with you. We can talk to you anytime. And you say, I will never leave you or for, forsake you. And Lord, I just thank you. Lord, you have a course for each of us to run individually, but then corporately together. We come back together to encourage one another in this race that we're running. So in whatever we do, help us to do it heartily. As for you, not for people. They'll get the benefit, but you first. And then, Lord, it's because of your amazing grace that you've given us new life. We submit to you. We praise your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen.